but Dera was a Turkish garrison town. When Lawrence made his attempt at reconnaissance in November 1917, he had to go to Dera in disguise as a Circassian Arab. It would be 24 hours before he left. His outlook on life changed forever, and it was to provide the most controversial chapter in his book and in his whole life. We mounted the curving bank of the Palestine Railway and from its vantage surveyed the station. Someone called out in Turkish. We walked on deftly, but a sergeant came over and took me roughly by the arm, saying, the bay wants you. They led me to the guard room, took away my belt, my knife, made me wash myself carefully. I passed a long day there. Soon after dark, three men came for me. They took me upstairs to the bay's room. He dragged me down with him in his arms. I bore it for a little, then jerked my knee into him. He drew one of the men's bayonets, pulled up a fold of the flesh over my ribs, worked the point through after considerable trouble, and gave the blade a half turn. The blood wavered down my side. He half whispered to the corporal to take me out and teach me everything. The corporal came back with a whip of the Circassian sort, a thong of supple black hide. I locked my teeth to endure this thing which lapped itself like a flaming wire about my body. A delicious warmth, probably sexual, was swelling through me. And then he flung up his arm and hacked with the full length of his whip into my groin. I next knew that I was being dragged about by two men, each disputing over a leg as though to split me apart, while a third man rode me astride. According to his own account, Lawrence was whipped into submission, his will broken. Though he managed finally to escape, the sexual assault he describes vividly and at great length seems to have left him mentally and physically scarred for the rest of his life. He ends his account with the words, in Dara that night, the citadel of my integrity had been irrevocably lost. I'm not by any means convinced that his description of what happened at Dara when he was supposed to have been set upon and assaulted by the Turkish commandant is an actual word by word true account of what happened. But I think underneath it all, there was a substratum of truth. I think just uh, imagination. He imagined. He imagined this. I, th I don't know what was his motive, either to glorify himself uh, much, much more, or uh, to inflict some damage on himself by uh, stating that he, he, he uh, went... Uh, uh, into a lot uh, of uh, torment. I think Lawrence enacted in that passage in the Seven Pillars a ritual of self ex or ex uh, of exposure and being caught uh, that was deeply necessary to, to his imagination. I mean, if he was carrying on all these masquerades, these charades, these adventures, the one thing that he had to risk was being caught and found out. And I think that's really what it's about. Now, as to what exactly happened, uh, and even whether it did happen, uh, is, it's one of these questions like whether Freud's theories of seduction are based on actual, experience, uh, actual experiences of seduction. I think we have to simply go with the notion that Lawrence believed it to have happened or believed it necessary to have experienced something like that and leave it at that. There is no reason at all to doubt that the thing took place one has to remember that the event actually took place in the context of the closing days of the Turkish Empire, which was a very brutal society, where this kind of thing went on. There's nothing remotely surprising about it. Uh, I think that if you look at Lawrence's later statements about sex and other associated things, they are very typical of somebody who has suffered this kind of experience. And I don't think, therefore, that you could readily explain those statements if the thing hadn't taken place. On the 9th of December, 1917, Jerusalem fell to the Allies. And two days later, Allenby, in deference to history, made his solemn entry into the Holy City on foot. 
Lawrence attended the ceremony in a borrowed uniform as a member of Allenby's personal staff. It was just three weeks after Derard. He was deeply moved by this historic occasion. For me, he wrote, it was the supreme moment of the war. Lawrence appears in the background of some of this newsreel footage, an unexpectedly small figure. He was five foot six inches tall and unobtrusive here without his Arab clothes. I met Lawrence in Jerusalem. I encountered Lawrence first on one of the narrow streets. He was with some Arabs. He didn't look like an Arab to me. And a little bit later, I got in touch with the British military governor of Jerusalem. I called him the successor to Pontius Pilate, Sir Ronald Storrs. And I told Storrs about this group of Arabs and one who was a blonde uh, wondered who he was. And Storrs opened a door to an adjoining room, and there he was. And Storrs was the one who was responsible for uh, labeling Lawrence, because he said to me, I want you to meet the uncrowned king of Arabia. The journalist Lowell Thomas had been sent to the Middle East in search of a war story that might make more inspiring copy than the carnage of the Western Front. He and his cameraman visited Lawrence and Faisal in Aqaba, and the shots they took there would later become part of Thomas's adventure film. Lowell Thomas propagated the heroic legend of Lawrence of Arabia, and perhaps unwittingly encouraged the idea that Lawrence, and not Faisal, was the true leader of the desert campaign. The question of Lawrence's leadership in the Arab Revolt is a very, very difficult question because you can lead on many levels. As far as the British were concerned, Lawrence was a liaison officer with the Arab forces and his responsibility was to see that the Arab forces did what the British CNC wanted done. Now, insofar as that happened, which on the whole it did happen, you have to say that one way or another, Lawrence persuaded directly, indirectly, subtly, unsubtly, he persuaded these people to go the way that Allenby wanted them to go. Now, that's one side of the picture. The other side of the picture is that, of course, in a general sense, these people wanted to go there anyway. <laughs> وليقول لك دوره رنس ما هو طيب ما هو صادق إلا يكذب الخواطر ولو رنس الرجل اشتغل والفضل للأشرار والفضل الكبير للأشرار the Imperial Camel Corps joined the desert campaign in its later stages. They operated separately from the Arab force, but Lawrence participated in the planning and support of some of their exploits. It was a chance for regular soldiers to witness this remarkable and now famous amateur in action. A lot of the Lawrence legend, you know, had been exaggerated terrifically. And most of his detractors and critics have been people who never saw him and certainly never worked with him and fought with him, and rode with him, and ate with him, and slept with him, as I did for several weeks on end. We knew Norms already by repute, of course. His fame had preceded him. We'd been out there long enough to have heard of a British officer doing remarkable things with the Arabs away to our right. One day, the lookout reported a group of Arabs, probably six or eight of them, camel mounted, of course, approaching from the southeast, from the approximate direction of Aqaba. So I went forward to interrogate them. And as I approached, I quickly realized that this wasn't necessary at all because their leader was an obvious European. No attempt at disguise beyond the fact that he was dressed completely in Arab costume. And uh, true enough, he introduced himself as Captain Lawrence. But as we got to know him better, of course, we all, the whole of the Camel Corps, or at least the whole of the, those of us who served with him, absolutely worshiped him. Lawrence, of course, was not militaristic in the ordinary sense. I think this is what endeared him to us. No staff college training. He was just a natural guerrilla leader with a knowledge, a thorough knowledge of the country, its people, its languages, its customs. 
It, it impressed us from the start because Lawrence was the first officer we'd ever had, the first commander we'd ever had who took his tro troops entirely into his confidence. Uh, and remember, these were the days of there's not to reason why. And later on, of course, he personally reconnoitred every one of our objectives before we were committed to the attack. One of the objectives to be hit by night was the railway station of Mudawara on the Hejaz line south of Akaba. It was defended by a substantial Turkish garrison. Our attack was at four o'clock in the morning in complete darkness as advised by Lawrence and it was a great success. The Turks were taken completely by surprise. They hadn't any idea there were any pucker British troops within a hundred miles. We even caught the Turkish, some of the Turkish officers were still in the bell tents in their pajamas. But when daylight came, we'd got the whole position except the northern redoubt, which was rather too strongly held for our small raiding party to take. But Lawrence had provided for this. And at first light, along came two planes uh, of the Hedjaz flight. And after a couple of hundred pound bombs from each, at very low altitude, of course, the Turks came streaming out, waving any dirty old rug which looked like a, a white flag. Uh, our prisoners, of course, almost outnumbered ourselves. So they were to be taken back by the Arabs to Aqaba at the rate of one golden sovereign per prisoner. But Lawrence knew perfectly well if we paid them the whole fee before they went, the Arabs would take them behind the nearest hill and shoot the lot. So they were paid at the rate of half a sovereign per head on dispatch with a chitty to the British commander in Aqaba to pay the, the remaining ten bob an office, we called it, when they got there, and point of fact, everyone arrived intact. But some regular officers, though they admired him, found Lawrence's style a shade flamboyant. I didn't approve of Lawrence's methods of blowing things up. He wasn't trained as a sapper, and he liked to make as big a bang as possible. He wasted a great deal of the explosives that had been brought great trouble on camelback for hundreds of miles. And on this occasion, he put everything he could lay his hand on under the bridge. Uh, knowing his habits, I said, now, please, sir, give me a little warning before you fire your charges. Let me get my men away. He said, oh, yes, all right, don't fuss, don't fuss. So uh, we went down, and I was quite happily in putting my charges in, and suddenly there was a most terrific bang, and the bridge flew into the air and fell all over the station. I was absolutely furious, as furious as a subaltern could be with a colonel, which had its limits. And he sat on a boulder and laughed at me. For a year and a half, I had been in motion, riding a thousand miles each month upon camels, with added nervous hours in crazy aeroplanes, or rushing across country in powerful cars. In my last five actions, I had been hit, and my body so dreaded further pain that now I had to force myself under fire. Generally, I had been hungry, lately always cold, and frost and dirt had poisoned my hurts into a festering mass of sores. My will had gone, and I feared to be alone, lest the winds of circumstance, or power, or lust, blow my empty soul away. The Arabs moved on northwards towards their goal, Damascus. Lawrence, riding with them, was still obsessed with the deceit being perpetrated by the Allies and by him. The cabinet raised the Arabs to fight for us by definite promises of self-government. It was evident from the beginning that if we won the war, these promises would be dead paper. I presumed, seeing no other leader with the will and power, that I would survive the campaigns and be able to defeat not merely the Turks on the battlefield, but my own country and its allies in the council chamber. I risked the fraud on my conviction that better we win and break our word than lose. He was very keen that the Arabs get to Damascus first because he wanted them to have a claim. He was with them that entering Damascus was important. And if they enter Damascus first, they will have a good claim in the peace discussions afterwards. 